Thank you. So welcome to this talk about the blockchain. And I considered different titles for this thing, so I picked this one. That's probably the one you, you saw in the, in the program, in the schedule, and it's the one you're here for. I also actually considered this one as an alternative, because I have to make this disclaimer first. I'm not a blockchain expert, right? I, I do know something about the blockchain. I know, this, know the stuff that I've gathered in the last year or so by playing around with different things, and I find it completely fascinating. So I'm going to try to share my enthusiasm for the whole thing. Now, if you hear me saying something that's wrong because you're a cryptocurrency expert or a cryptographer, please raise your hand and correct me. I'm perfectly fine with that, so please do that. That said, I strongly believe that the blockchain is actually more than just a hype. I believe that a lot of the money now flowing into the startups that do something with the blockchain is completely misguided, and there are lots of people wasting millions and millions of euros by investing in something they don't understand which is probably the way it has to be. Right? That's probably the way of the world, and we have to, we, uh, they actually are taking that risk, and they hopefully know that when they invest in 100 companies, one or, one or two of them will survive and make them a lot of money, so that's fine. But still, despite a lot of skepticism, and despite a lot of people wondering whether this is actually real, after spending time with it, I'm firmly convinced it is. So what I'll try to do today is I'll try to talk about the basic principles behind the blockchain. I'll start with Bitcoin as the most prominent example, and I'm going to use it uh, to illustrate some of the major uh, features, some of the core workings of the whole concept. And then we'll talk a little bit about Ethereum as the second, second uh, well-known uh, instance of something running on a blockchain. And then we'll talk about some other, uh, in, some other applications and some possible use cases and some benefits and downsides, and maybe we'll have a little Q&A session at the end, although the schedule is pretty tough. At any point in time, feel free to interrupt or just raise your hand or put a question into the, into the uh, conference tool. So let's start with Bitcoin. So who, who here in the room owns Bitcoin? Anybody here who does? That's a reasonable number of people. It's not, I would put it at about 10%, something like that. So that's pretty good, I think. Probably in the overall population, it's more like 0.00001%. So you're a good audience for this. So let's talk about what Bitcoin is and isn't. So first of all, it is the first and most prominent practical application of cryptography to do the things that we now associate with a cryptocurrency. So it maintains this history of transactions. It maintains a history of who gave what amount of virtual money to, well, actual money to somebody else. Right? It does this with guaranteed consistency. So we know that this record we have about all the transactions that happened in the past is correct. And we know that it can be forged, can be manipulated. You can decide that you didn't actually spend that money on something when you did, in fact, spend it. And the, and the key thing is it does this without an intermediary. So you don't have a bank or any central authority making that guarantee to you. There is no state, no government, no centralized anything that does that. It's, the, it's, the, it's the, the union of all the people participating in this particular thing, which is the critical new innovation about this, about this whole thing. It's very resistant to forgery and fraud. And I know that probably all of you have heard about all the disasters that happened to people who lost their Bitcoin. None of these things actually happened to the cryptographically sound core of the system. Right? It was not as if the blockchain or Bitcoin itself has been hacked at any point in time. It was always at the boundaries of going from one system to the other, and we'll get to, in, to that in more detail. And you probably know a little bit of the soap opera history of the whole thing, so it was created by this mysterious person or number of persons, who knows. Um, it definitely still is the most successful cryptocurrency, although in the last few months, Ethereum has gathered a lot of, a lot of drive, and it's become very, very important. It's pretty close now, and who knows, maybe a half, half a year from now, it'll have overtaken Bitcoin in terms of capitalization. So what does it mean, apply cryptography? I mean, if most people that I know here, cryptography is like, oh my god, this is all this complicated stuff that we talked about. In fact, don't worry about it, because the little cryptography that you need to understand to understand how the blockchain works can be understood even by me, so I'm sure you'll do fine as well. It's very easy. 
You probably all know what a hashing algorithm does. If not, I'll explain it to you in about 10 seconds. We have this piece of data on the left, and then we have an algorithm, and that algorithm produces some sort of fingerprint. Right? You put in the data, and it'll, it'll put out some, some hash value that actually changes if you change even a single bit of the incoming data. If you make a slight change, the data changes. And as you can, as you've probably guessed, this is irreversible, right? This does not go in both directions. You can create this hash value from the data, so you know this is the kind of data that actually created that hash, and it's a repeatable process. So if you have this piece of data, you can compute the hash again, and you can check whether the hash that somebody else claimed is valid for this data is correct. And that's basically it. That's almost all we need for the whole thing. Now, there's a little more to it, which is related to this uh, public and private key. Um, cryptography thing, which I'm sure you've also heard about and also used it if any time you send an assigned email or an encrypted email or any time you use a TLS to negotiate an HTTPS connection to some server, that's what happens underneath. In this particular case, all you need to understand is that uh, we have these things. We have a private key and a public key. In fact, we can derive the public key from the private key. We can compute it. So we essentially just need a private key. That's what you need to have to get this public key, then you can hand this public key to somebody else. And then, because these two were, because one was derived from the other, they have a certain mathematical relationship that allows you to do certain kinds of operations. So for example, you can use the private key to sign some data, essentially computing a hash, and you can use the public key to validate that the signature actually came from the person who has the corresponding private key. So if I have a private key, I can do certain things that you can validate if you have my public key, which is why I distribute my public key globally. I give it to anyone. Anybody can, take, can use that key to make that check. Right. So that's, that's basically the, all the cryptography that we need for, for a basic understanding of a blockchain. A little bit of asymmetric uh, cryptography and a little bit of hashing, and that's basically it. So how does Bitcoin actually work? Let's take a look at the vocabulary and all of the things that make up this Bitcoin universe. And you have all of those concepts that are related in some way. And we'll sort of zoom in and talk about each of them in a little bit more detail. So first of all, we start with Bitcoin itself. So obviously, Bitcoin is the technology. It's the first thing that came up with this, with this uh, synthesis of, of ideas that ended up being the blockchain. In fact, this technology was, of course, built upon earlier things. Like, for example, hashing is a very old idea. Right? And there are other ideas, like, for example, the proof-of-work stuff that we're going to get to in a second that were inspired by earlier work by other people. But this combination of the whole thing to build an, a, a cryptographic ledger, something that records a history of transactions without having to trust any, any single party, is something that was only uh, introduced with Bitcoin about eight or nine years ago. I think it was 2009. Bitcoin is the technology. Bitcoin is obviously also the currency. And as any currency, um, it has to be created somehow, as, as any, any, any kind of currency that you're aware of, any fiat currency that you're aware of. Um, uh, Bitcoins also have to be created, and they, they're being created following a predefined process. It's called mining. Um, it's called uh, uh, well, actually creating these coins through the process of mining. We'll get to that a little later on. Um, and the amount of uh, Bitcoin that can ever be created is limited by the original algorithm. For, I'm sure you've heard of that. There can only ever be, I think, 21 million Bitcoin as a whole. That's it. There's never going to be more. Um, so there is no central bank that can decide to just print more banknotes. Nobody can make that decision because it's been predefined in the actual algorithms. There are more a little more information about these units, a million Bitcoin, and um, there's a the smallest unit, which is a Satoshi. And um, obviously, coins are, as I mentioned before, not maintained, well, maybe it's not obvious, but coins are not maintained as part of, a, of an account balance. This is not, it's not as if, because I own some Bitcoin, I have an account, and this account has a balance of whatever 0 0.5 Bitcoin. In fact, the sum in my account is the sum is, is computed by looking at all the past transactions. Every transaction that ended up giving me some money that I haven't yet spent in jointly makes up the balance in my virtual account, which is never explicit, which also means that it's not anonymous. If I'm careful and if I create a new key pair or a new key for every transaction that I do, it's hard to find out who I am, but it's not impossible. It's pseudonymous, pseudonymous. so it's actually a pseudonym that I'm acting under, and it's not anonymous. Right, so that's the basic idea about Bitcoin. 
So if there is no account with a balance, what actually is a wallet? That would be the second thing to talk about. And a wallet um, is actually just a shorthand name for, to make this easier for people to understand. In fact, for a computer person, it's kind of the wrong word because the wallet is not really a wallet. It doesn't keep my money. The wallet actually keeps my keys. Right? So my private keys are stored in a wallet. And because the private keys control who can spend the money that I haven't yet spent, um, it's actually my way to access my, my coin in the system. So when I download a wallet, which is a piece of software, I can actually use it to create a new private key, and it'll securely, hopefully securely store that private key so that I can use it later on. You can imagine that it's used to sort of sign transactions, a little bit more complicated than that, but it's fine for now. Um, and you can imagine there are multiple implementations for different operating systems for different kinds of devices. Most people I know actually use their mobile device, they use their smartphone uh, to, to maintain their wallets, or they use some offline or hardware solution. Because the one thing that maybe is one key takeaway that you should take away from here is that an online wallet is also known as a very bad idea. Don't ever do that. Right? There are people who offer you for, to keep your keys for you. That's very nice of them. But I suggest you don't do that. I don't suggest you ever do that with any sort of private key because it sort of defeats the point of the whole thing. Because it's just a little bit of mess and nothing more, you can also have an offline wallet. It's just a piece of paper. Could be a piece, could be a piece of hardware specifically built for that purpose that uh, you maybe unlock with a fingerprint or with some sort of card or whatever it is. That's essentially the idea of a wallet. So if you have a wallet, it'll have those keys. You can have multiple keys. Bitcoin allows you and, in fact, encourages you to create more and more keys to sort of make sure you can't be tracked that easily because nobody is supposed to know how much money you have, especially if you have lots of them. So we talked about Bitcoin, we talked about wallet, let's talk about transactions. Transactions obviously are the most important thing in terms of what you're interested in. You want to actually transact with the system. It's a little, more, little, little convoluted maybe, so I'm, I'm not necessarily expecting you to understand all of the details right now, but essentially the idea is that you have this unspent transaction output. Every transaction has an output, and some of that output hasn't been spent yet, so it's still available. Some other part of that output has not been spent, right? So what does that mean? It actually means that it's like, in, like, a, like, a, like a cash transaction. If I pay for something using a Bitcoin transaction, what happens is that I happen to have the unspent output of 10 other transactions, like I have one that gave me 10, bit, well, a little, 10 milli Bitcoin, another one that gave me two, another one that gave me four, which adds up to 16, and now I need to pay for 15, that's the price I have to pay for this particular thing, and I don't have the exact 15 amount unspent, so obviously when I input that to the transaction, the output will be, well, 15 will go to the person I'm paying, and one will go back to me. Sort of like change that you're getting back when you're paying with coin, with real physical coin or bills. It's made pretty sure that I'm the only one who can spend that stuff, right? The, 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 trans the actual, the actual uh, uh, spending is controlled because of the things, because the things are sort of signed with the, with the thing. So you could call it, the wording they use is they sort of encumbered with the recipient's key, right? I make sure when I do a transaction that the output from this transaction is cryptograph cryptographically secured so that only the correct recipient can use them as inputs to the next transaction. Make sense? I hope so. So that is essentially the idea of a transaction. And because we have this, this complicated peer-to-peer -peer system, it's a very good question to ask, how, what do I do with this transaction? I mean, I can create this transaction if I, if I know the, the recipient's public, public key, well, actually, their address, that's the terminology. If I know their address, the address that they want to receive the Bitcoin at, I can create this transaction. I could even compute it by hand if I wanted to. It'll take me a long time, and I could do that. But what do I do with it? I now have this data structure, this thing, and in fact, I send it to one of the nodes. Right? So the nodes in this peer-to-peer -peer system are all the participants who collaborate to create the joint Bitcoin system. So I publish the transaction to one of the nodes that I happen to have a connection to, and then I hope for the best. So what is that thing? What's, what's supposed to happen next? Obviously, the transaction has to be checked. Maybe I spent somebody else's money. Maybe I made some other error. Maybe I created a bad data structure, so what happens next? In fact, this transaction is now being validated, and the result of that validation is, happens as part of something called a block. 
So you can see that we're slowly approaching what a friggin' blockchain actually is. So we're getting closer. So what's a block? A block essentially is a larger data structure that um, references transactions. Right? So you have this block, and in my model that I just described, it'll reference maybe a thousand transactions. Those transactions will be included in that block, and then that block will, um, so somebody who creates that block, that will be one of the nodes, will actually validate all of the transactions and then they will sign the block as a whole. So they make sure that they have, they, that they, they sort of make sure they've, they, everybody knows that they correctly validated this thing. Now, in a, if you were to design such a system from scratch, how would you go about making sure that you, that you know this was the correct answer? I mean, anybody could forge anything there, right? So typically what we do in uh, the systems that we know is we trust that person. For example, when you, when you do a, an HTTPS connection, then you implicitly trust the whole CA process, right? which is a bit of a stretch, but we tend to do that, right? So we trust the fact that in our browser, there's a hierarchy of certificate authorities, relationships to certain certificates, and when something comes in, we know that this is probably okay, but that's an explicitly not what any of the blockchain-based systems, at least the public blockchain systems do. Instead, they rely on something called uh, the proof of work. So as somebody who does this validation, as somebody who creates a block, who mines a block, that's the word, right? I mine a block, I'm, I have to prove that I actually did some work. I have to prove that I actually spent some money on energy, on electricity to operate a CPU for a while to come up with a hash. And the trick they use to do this is, is kind, of, uh, kind of ingenious, which is that um, the hash that is computed for the block as a whole has to start with a predefined number of zeros. Now, if you know how a hash works, it's damn hard to come up with a hash that starts with a number of zeros because you can't predict what it'll look like. You have this input stuff, and if you change the input stuff, you'll get a new hash, and it'll very likely not start with eight zeros. So you'll try again, and then maybe it will. So how do you do that? In fact, there is one value in that block, which is called a nonce. It's sort of a value that you yourself, as a miner, can change, and you continue to change that value until you get a hash that validates with, uh, that ha actually starts with a number of zeros and validates the whole block. So this is a critical thing. So think of this block as this data structure that includes references to all the transactions, right? It has this, uh, this uh, um, nonce, and the computation of the hash from all of this information, including some others that I'll get to, has to create a value that has this starting thing, right? So it'll take you a long time to do that. In fact, when Bitcoin started, you were able to participate in this with your laptop, right? You just, you know, you installed the software and then your laptop started mining coin. Unfortunately, probably none of us actually did that to a significant degree, otherwise we would be sitting in some holiday resort in the Caribbean instead of wasting our time at a conference. So you, were, you would have been able to make a real, really bad amount of money, but probably none of us did. So what people do these days is they operate specialized hardware. In fact, some people say that the, the, the most current advances in hardware, in, in computing power, are driven by Bitcoin miners. Specialized hardware explicitly created for the process of computing hashes over Bitcoin blocks. Because this is now something where you can make money from. Now, why do we talk about blocks and why do we talk about the blockchain? Well, one thing that I haven't mentioned before is that any block references the previous block. So, the, the address of the previous block, which is actually its hash, but it doesn't matter, the reference to the previous block is included in the data that's being signed with that hash. So I, can, I don't only prove that this block is valid, I also prove that the connection to the previous block is valid, which means that the previous block is itself valid, which proves that the previous block is valid, and so on up to the genesis block, the original block that Satoshi put into the original Bitcoin software which is why the whole thing forms a chain, right? So we have this chain of, of reference blocks. All of them are validated. Um, and you can possibly see how the number of blocks relates to the level of trust that you can have in the whole thing. So if, if you consider how hard it is to forge something, then to forge the very latest block, you only have to compute a new, a new version of this thing, right? Whereas to go back six or seven or 10 blocks, you would have to forge all the others as well. That is a very expensive thing. Actually, you'll end up spending more money on, on forging things than, um, than you would on actually playing by the rules. 
which is a great way to make people play by the rules. If it's more expensive to cheat, then why would you do it? Right? So it's easier to just you know, follow the rules and make money doing that as opposed to using all of the power that you have or the hashing power that you have to try to, to, uh, to fraud someone of their money. And that's, actually some, that's actually something that you can see. When you do a Bitcoin transaction, what happens is that the transaction is transmitted to the network, gets distribute, distributed, and um, then the, the miners create a block, and if there's the first validation of that transaction, you can be somewhat sure that it was okay, because at least somebody has validated it, but you can't be really sure. But if you wait for the number of time it takes to mine six more blocks, then it'll be so hard to change that outcome of that transaction that you can reasonably start shipping goods. Right? You can ship a car if somebody paid for it using Bitcoin, and you're six blocks into the validation chain after that transaction, that's kind of okay. That's what people do. Right? It's perfectly fine to trust that thing. So this, I know this is a lot to take in if you haven't heard of it before, but hopefully, if you, hopefully some things at least start to clear up a bit. So we have these blocks, and I mentioned they're, they're, uh, they're chains to form this blockchain. So now we're talking a little bit more about mining and this proof of work kind of thing. So the Bitcoin miners, are those who actually invest computing power into coming up with these new, with these new blocks, right? That's what they do. And they do this by doing this proof of work thing, which is actually um, you know, meeting this difficulty target. That's actually the number of zeros, simplifying here, but doesn't matter. So the number of zeros determines how hard it is, how many, how likely or how unlikely it is that a random hash will start with that value. If I say just one zero at the beginning, that's much easier than it, if it has to have 10 zeros. I mentioned that already. The difficulty is actually adjusted over time. So over time, it gets more and more um, difficult because the hardware ca capabilities increase all the time. So we do that, and uh, the system actually works in a way so that it maintains a certain amount of time that it typically takes for a block to be mined. It's around 10 minutes. It's been increasing recently for complicated reasons, but that's about the idea. So after an hour, you've got six blocks. Six blocks is considered a reasonable amount of blocks to trust something that happened. And that sounds like a long time. You can only trust your coin being successfully spent or received after an hour. But in fact, that's much better than what you get from your bank. Because with your bank, if you get a statement, they could, they can, they could roll it back on the next day or even the next week. But you cannot be really sure. You have to wait an, a number of weeks to make sure that nobody can still roll back that transaction. This, you can never roll back a committed uh, transaction on the blockchain. The mining process, where you actually invest this amount of work, obviously it means that somebody's spending money. Right? This, this, this person or company or organization actually doing the mining spends a significant amount of money for creating a box. So why would they do that? It's another very cool idea about this whole, this whole scheme, which is that mining creates new coin. So every time a block is mined, a reward is given to the miner who mined that block. I believe it currently sits at 12.5, but I may be mistaken. It halves every, every, few, every few months, every, something like 18 months, it halves. It started with 50 Bitcoin, moved to 25, moved to 12.5. May still, may still be at there, or at six, whatever. Four years. Thank you very much. So, th so this is the only way we get new Bitcoin. And that is a very good motivation, because a Bitcoin is now worth a significant amount of money, right? A Bitcoin sits at about, I don't know, $2,500, something like that these days. So getting 12.5 Bitcoin means you're getting, I don't know, 30, I can't calculate, whatever, 30-something thousand dollars, which is probably reason enough to, to invest some time on that. There also is an optional transaction fee. So if you want to, if you want your transaction to be processed faster, you can say that some of the output, well, one, one of the outputs will be a fee given to the miner, and that's actually the, the rest, the, the, rem, the remainder. If you spend all the outputs and whatever remains is automatically given to the miner. And you can adjust that. You can say, well, I'm willing to pay a dollar or five dollars or ten dollars for this transaction because I really care about it being processed quickly. And the miners will actually take in the transactions that have a higher fee with priority because obviously they're motivated by money to do that. Which in turn also means if you don't spend that transaction fee, it might take a longer time for doing that, right? for actually reaching this valid state. So let's go over the rest quickly. So we have those nodes. I think I mentioned them before. They form this peer-to-peer -peer network, right? The whole collaboration thing. They relay messages. That's one of their roles. So they, they pass along the transactions to the others. They validate transactions and blocks. And they actually, if they're a full node, a so-called full node, they maintain a copy of the full blockchain. So everything that ever happened on this blockchain is contained in their 
in their data storage. So it's essentially a huge, I don't know, maybe a few hundred gigs, maybe a little over 100 gigs right now, is actually stored on your disk when you, when you run a full node. So you better have some time downloading that stuff. What did, I what, what did I fail to mention? One thing that I didn't mention, and that could be a reasonable, a reasonable thing you're wondering about, is who actually decides who's the one who creates the block? Right? And that actually is an interesting question we'll get to in a second, right? So it's, uh, it's actually a race between all the participants who are into mining blocks. They all compete for, for coming up with the first one who's able to create a new block that, uh, that is valid. I think I mentioned the blockchain linked list. Da -da -da um, in fact, every node will validate all of the blockchain once they're downloading it, which is why it takes some time. So let me get to this, because this is the key, the most important thing I want to get to, which is the consensus thing. So how do the participants in this distributed peer-to-peer -peer network agree on something? How can you make them agree that this is actually the correct history? And as I mentioned, this is this, this thing of being in a, in a race, right? So we have this, these blocks. We have this immutability. And consensus essentially means I, I need to have the longest chain, right? So if I, have, if I, as a miner, get notified of a new block, then I'll take a look at that block and see, well, it's actually, it actually references 500 blocks before it. That's a, that's a good thing. If somebody has found this new block. I can actually start mining my new block and making this the previous block for my block. Now, somebody else notifies me that there's a longer version of the chain that has more blocks. And that's actually a tempting thing. So which of those do I pick? And the general idea is I pick the one that's the longest, because that is the one that has the most consensus. And if I'm mining a block, I want to be the one who creates the next block in the whole thing, right? But if somebody has overtaken me by already finding that, I throw away my work and start doing that. So essentially, after a little while, even though the, even though the chain may split a little bit, it'll converge again. That's the distributed consensus by means of the longest chain of the proof of work approach. So if you got that, you got Bitcoin and blockchain. Right. So we have multiple parties competing about finding the next block, and then uh, everybody take, observes the others like a race where all the runners look at where the others are and decide on their strategy. And um, uh, once you know that you've lost, you maybe, I don't know, the analogy fails me here, you start a new race or you wait for the next, the next tournament to, to help you there. Made, made sense so far? Any questions right now? This would be a very good point. Yes, please. Yes. Yeah, so that can happen. What can happen is you, you've made a bad investment. You wasted some money calculating that block. You're in the middle of that calculation. You've already wasted uh, energy for 1,000 euros or $1,000, and then somebody else comes along with that block. Yes, that can happen to you. So it's kind of... Like any other investment, right? You, you measure your returns and you decide whether you're, whether you're succeeding with a reasonable amount of probability and whether you actually make money from this thing or not. I'm not sure I, I just didn't understand you from... Yeah, so actually the, the question is, are there groups of winners and groups of losers? In fact, there is something called mining pools so people mine their, their resources. You can actually participate in a mining pool instead of setting up your own thing. And you have all of them competing with each other globally. Right? There's a lot of mining power in China. One of the reasons that this is true is because in China, energy is pretty cheap. Because, so I've heard, they don't care that much about the environmental effects. Though I'm starting to wonder if other countries in the world do care that, whatever. So, of course, the cost of energy is one factor that determines how good you are, you are at that. Another factor is how fast is your network? For example, is your, is your network inhibited by censorship? Right? Is there some great firewall that makes it hard for your blocks to get to the other people? So it's, it's really a complicated thing. And in fact, to get to forge anything by the power you have, you would have to be able to get more than 51% of the hashing power of the whole network. So you have to, be, have to become as powerful as half the world. That's not happened so far. If it ever did, that would be a real problem. But at the moment, the distribu distribution makes sure this, uh, for economic reasons, doesn't happen as quickly. So, one more question, and then I have to continue. Yes? Sorry, I didn't catch that. 
Well, it allows you to forge because you can essentially make a fake history the correct history, right? You collaborate, you combine all that hashing power to change history. For example, erase the fact that you had spent all your millions on this particular thing while you still have whatever you bought with it, right? So that would be one thing. So I have to continue, otherwise I won't get through. So one of the cool things of Bitcoin that I'm going to leave it is that it actually isn't, this, isn't as static as it seems. In fact, it has something called script, Bitcoin script. That is actually what's happening whenever you do one of those transactions. In fact, Bitcoin script is um, intentionally limited scripting. It has the power of a very limited stack-based language, like fourth. And I'm going to fly over this. Essentially, what you do is you encode a script when you do a transaction, and somebody has to provide the correct parameters for this script to arrive at a solution that you pre-computed for it to be valid. So it's programmable, programmable to a certain degree. Now, the, um, this allows you to do fancy things like, for example, um, ensure that multiple recipients um, uh, provide their, their private key to spend something. So you can pay to multiple people at once, maybe some heritage, some legacy kind of thing where you pay to multiple people. And this is a very cool idea. In fact, this idea, this concept of a programmable blockchain led to the next big invention. I'm going to go over that next, which is Ethereum. So Ethereum also is based on a blockchain, but Ethereum is different in one specific regard. So let's go over the commonalities first. Ethereum versus Bitcoin. Blockchain in both of them, uh, a slightly different currency called Ether, doesn't really matter. Blocks are a little faster, maybe once a minute. It's also proof of work based, although that's supposed to change in the near future sometime this year to proof of stake, but I'm not going to get into that. The cool thing about Ethereum is that it is a platform for arbitrary contracts. That's the so-called smart contract you might have heard of. That is a pretty cool idea. The idea here is that you make that program something that you can put on the blockchain, and then that program can be the recipient of transact or the target of transactions. All the state is maintained as part of the blockchain, and that now means that you not only have your, your classical recipient like in Bitcoin, you also have this new kind of thing. So accounts can be externally owned, that would be like in Bitcoin, right? I am the recipient of some unspent transaction output, so I can use it as input to some other transactions. But recipients can also be code. It's like an agent. It's, I put some sort of agent on the blockchain, and now that agent will act according to its program. Right? Like a company acts according to its statutes, right? to its, to its uh, founding uh, statement, whatever, whatever it is. So the contract here, the, the, the agent program specifies all of the rules for interaction. And by means of a special kind of transaction, you can actually put code on that blockchain. And then it sits there and waits for others to interact with that code and do something predetermined. Like, for example, give you a small fee and maintain some sort of record or maybe interact with a different system or do some computation. You're running code on the blockchain. In fact, what you're doing is you're running code on all of the nodes that validate anything on that blockchain, because every node will have to now run that program that you put in there, which seems like a, like a pretty crazy idea, because that essentially means I'll give you code and ask you to run it for me. That is something that um, anyone who's even remotely familiar with security will have some doubts about. Right? Do you really want to do that? I'm, I'm not so sure. So what, what Ethereum does is it defines a way for doing that, and then it defines a way for you to pay for it. So there's a concept, concept of gas on Ethereum, which is essentially money used to uh, pay for computation. So when you, when you invoke a method, when you do something, you have to pay for the cost incurred by the system for that. And so you determine that. It's sort of like you, you, know, you, fuel, you put that amount of fuel into that transaction, and then that's all you can spend. No more. If you do, an, if you do a loop that doesn't return, it'll run for only as long as you have gas to spend or money to waste. So the execution of instructions consumes gas. Make sense? So you can, you can prevent somebody from running a query that never returns, one of the classical problems if you open up a SQL endpoint to the, to the Internet. Ethereum, for this purpose, has, a, uh, has different programming languages, has a low-level uh, language, a low-level bytecode, like the JVM or the CLR. This is called the Ethereum VM. Multiple languages target this thing. Um, in fact, the most important one is Solidity, which is sort of like a typed JavaScript language. And you can use that to write your contracts. There are nice development environments. There are command line tools. There are integrated visual environments. You can download all of that stuff from ethereum.org. And you can essentially program something that acts as if it were a real 
entity, a real company or organization that actually does something smart. That is not doing justice to Ethereum, right? I just spent three slides on the whole thing, and we could probably do a two- or three-day workshop. In fact, I think yesterday there was a one-day workshop on Ethereum alone. The, one, the thing that I wanted to get across is that the blockchain thing has its root in the Bitcoin world, and even the Bitcoin world included the script idea. And Ethereum essentially takes that script idea and makes it a general purpose kind of thing, which is a very, very cool concept. So we're now taught, we've looked at the, at the two big things. So let's briefly look at some of the alternatives so that you know where to put those words. There are, similar impl there are implementations of similar ideas. So for example, there are lots of alternative coin-based coin systems with a special purpose or a generic, uh, all derived from the same ideas, more or less, at least. Essentially, this is just research, right? It started nine years ago. The research, in fact, started nine years ago, right? This is really, really brand new and very immature stuff. This is not at the end of its life cycle at all. It's really just starting. So those are some of the things. Namecoin, for example, is something that explicitly targets at, um, at, chain, at dis disrupting DNS, right? The idea is that you actually register domains with the system and that you, get a, you do away with the intermediary necessary for maintaining all the mappings from names to addresses, right? That's something Namecoin supports. And there are lots of ways, and we're not going to detail on that. Um, those are all, well, I think all of them are in general public, like Ethereum, and well, Ethereum's changed that recently, but like Bitcoin is. Bitcoin is a public and open blockchain. Anybody can participate. You don't need permission from anybody, which is if you look at it from a political, standpoint a very critical important thing right if i'm living in a third third uh, third uh, world country or in some country where the where the where the government um, is a dictatorship and, f and the economy is in ruins i can still participate in bitcoin i have a very little chance of getting a visa card or a, an american express card but i can participate in bitcoin that is not true for permission ledgers a permission letter requires permission for you to participate in the whole thing so in addition to all of those public things that I mentioned, there is an incredible amount of private ledgers or closed group ledgers. Similar technology with some variance in, in terms of scalability and speed and all of that stuff. And all of them actually um, uh, have the same goal. They're used internally or with trusted partners. They allow you to maybe, as, uh, as a bank, collaborate with other banks. Is this me? as a bank together with other banks to maybe create your own closed blockchain for some internal use case. Lots of startups, not going to name all. Maybe, maybe I'll refer to this one uh, open source initiative, Hyperledger, um, which is uh, pretty well known these days. Um, it's open source at Apache. It has some very, very uh, well-known people. It has IBM behind it, lots of other companies who you want to use this to actually disrupt the, or to uh, participate in the disruption that this whole blockchain thing is about to bring. In fact, Ethereum recently uh, got the Ethereum Enterprise Alliance, or the other way around, Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, which uh, is also looking at uh, use cases for the same software in, in closed or more closed groups. And that has actually given Ethereum a lot of drive and a lot of raise in their actual uh, currency value. So what's cool about this whole thing? Let's do this very briefly. One very cool thing is that you have this distributed consensus thing, right? You don't have the central authority. You have pretty immediate, mostly unbreakable trust in this whole thing. So nothing, well, of course, it can be broken if you have enough power, but it's highly unlikely, which is a, a very cool thing. It's open, anyone can participate, and there is no centralized control. So it's really, truly globalized. Depending on your, on your political leanings, you either like that a lot or you hate it, right? It depends on your view on what the role of the state should be, and we can discuss that at lunch. But essentially, it is open to anybody, at least if it's an open blockchain like those. So we're skipping the detour into politics here. The key idea is that you can disrupt intermediaries. Every time you have somebody who is responsible for providing consistency as a service, you could potentially disrupt them using a blockchain approach. Right? Because that's what a, a clearing center does. That's what a bank does. That's what all of these people do who maintain a registry of something that many people depend on. All these intermediaries have a risk of turning into a monopoly, of, of charging ridiculous prices. Think of the financial networks. Think of the cost that a transaction on one of the global credit card networks actually incurs. And think of your power to change that thing. If you've ever, ever interacted with some of the more well-known payment companies on the internet, you probably know what I mean. 
it's possibly influenced by politics, right? If somebody decides that we want to have more of that, then uh, of course you, um, you just have to play by their rules because your influence is very limited. The blockchain has the potential of cutting out the middleman in this whole thing, right? So that is, that is one of the key disrupt disruptive, disruptive ideas here. We reduce the cost for the whole thing. Um, we, we have um, everywhere where somebody relies on, on cost reductions for this stuff, we actually um, um, can, uh, can reduce the cost by just relying on this distributed model. What you can do is you can even you can reduce the cost of the blockchain. If you look at Bitcoin, Bitcoin is under criticism because it wastes a lot of energy. You could argue whether it's actually wasting it because it is doing it's creating some value with it, right? The value of having this network, but still it 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 creates a lot of heat right, to do this proof of work kind of thing, and that feels bad because it would be nicer if we didn't have to do that. Specifically, if we have more trust, I don't trust any random person on the internet. So I'm happy that this proof of work thing protects me. But if I have a contractual relationship to some other companies in a country where rules and, and laws are reasonably enforced, then maybe I need a little less trust. So the permission model could be an interesting, an interesting way to go about this. So those are sort of the good parts of the whole thing. But what about the bad parts? What about all those things that you heard of that really are, are pretty bad? So one thing that I have to mention, because very briefly, is the Bitcoin fraud discussion. I think I mentioned that before. Every Bitcoin theft, every time something bad happened to any of those things, it was always at the exchanges, always at the boundary when you go from Bitcoin to something else. Because when you do that, currently, you have to interact with some sort of exchange. And if you make the mistake of leaving your money there, as opposed to transferring it so that it resides on your private account, so it, all the stuff is encumbered with the keys that you only hold privately, you have this risk of of being, um, uh, being a victim of fraud. And that can happen, and that is a really sad thing. But it's not a systematic, not a technical restriction. Um, it's, in fact, much less vulnerable than any other currency. And this is true for Bitcoin, right? It's because it's, you know exactly what, what it can happen. You don't know the, the, the economic effects it's going to have on society. You don't know the trading value it's going to have to, with the outside currencies. But inside, it's actually pretty, uh, pretty reasonable. Another, another thing that's often mentioned is the Ethereum of vulnerability, specifically the DAO. So if you, if you consider that, that was actually one of those smart contracts that allowed people, simplifying very, very strongly here, it allowed people to invest money into this company that some people just created. They created a contract, and so it wasn't a company, it was an incorporated company. It was just a contract that you could send money to. And that contract then would spend this money on investing and return the, the, the return on investment to its owners, right? The, kind of, an, of a joint fund of things, which is a pretty cool thing. Because it all, all ran, it was very, very fancy. There are lots of those things. And this one, I think, gathered up to $100 million in about a month. $100 million of value was put into the DAO. And then about 60 million of those were stolen. And they were stolen because there was a bug in the contract code. Now, that is one of the risks, right? One of the risks when you run this code and trust it is that there's a, there's a bug somewhere. In fact, people knew about this bug for a few days before, but nobody actually sort of expected that somebody would have enough incentive to exploit it, although I have to say that 60 million US dollars sounds like a pretty good incentive to me. Whatever, somebody did it. So what do you do then? What the Ethereum people did was they did a hard fork. A hard fork is a, a fork in the, in the chain that allows you, that ha requires you to update to a new version of the software to participate in the, in, the new in the new block validation process. And they essentially rewrote history. They rewrote the DAO and all the related transactions out of history and continued as if it had never happened. Which brings up very interesting philosophical and political questions. Was that a good thing to do? Was it correct? Wasn't it that the bug in the code is actually correct? Because that's what everybody agreed on. In fact, we now have two Ethereums, Ethereum Classic and Ethereum. That's because with a fork, some people decided to stay with the old one, which creates also all sorts of very interesting problems. Yeah. So in the interest of time, I'm going to skip um, over a few things and talk about what I, uh, what I believe today. Yeah, let me do that. So after spending time with this whole thing, um, I've come to believe uh, certain things. One of the things is that I absolutely, strongly, firmly convinced that this thing is here to stay. This is not going to go away. This is not something that is just overhyped and stupid and unnecessary and not useful. I, I would be pretty careful 
in risking my life savings in any of those currencies, right? I know people who do that, but I'd be pretty careful because I care about my life savings. Maybe you don't. Maybe you could have a little play money that you could put there. That, that would be okay. But it's going to play a significant role because it's really a new way of doing things. The second thing that I've come to believe is that it's a bad idea to dismiss the public blockchains. Many people do that. So if you look at the typical trade magazine, sort of pop science IT magazine, they'll say, well, yeah, the blockchain is the cool thing. Bitcoin is just this bad thing for hackers. I'm not sure. I've heard the same things being said about the internet a while ago, because we had all of those much better networks. It was actually the internet, the public internet, that we now do everything on. So I think there's a certain chance that one of those public blockchains will actually, because of the network effect, end up being the backbone of whatever else happens. Maybe permission ledgers, this closed thing, is the future, but maybe it's just a stepping stone to something that, like, like an intranet or extranet, if anybody remembers those words, right? like old people like me do, this was the kind of idea because before everybody committed to doing stuff on the internet anyway. Also, a pretty new development is that you can actually connect that stuff. You could actually now have sort of a, a bidirectional bridge between one of the public block blockchains and one of your private ones so that you can actually uh, um, profit from the network effect while still having full control over your own destiny, your own chain. And I think the barrier to entry has never been as low. I've, I've played with this stuff, and it's absolutely amazing that you can download this software, write a program, and then be online with a business actually making money without talking to anybody, without getting anybody's permission. This is really amazing. I've never seen such a quick way from having an idea, putting it into code, and then actually having it as a, as a business running. And because this is sort of what this whole thing is about, disrupt or be disrupted is strongly my opinion. I think we do have a little time. I don't think this is going to change everything next year, but I think it's extremely important and it's something that you definitely should take a look at. And with that, I guess I'm out of time and maybe have time for one or two questions, if you have any.